Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining this session. I am just uh, waiting for everyone to join. My name is Nduta Wambura. I am the Kenya Country Representative for Erasmus Mundus Association, and I am so happy to join in with you today. Um, wherever you're listening in from, please uh, put in a comment uh, where you're listening in from and what questions you might have um, regarding Erasmus Joint Master's Program application process as well as um, obviously how to go about the whole um, you know application as well as transition from uh, Kenya obviously to come and study within the European Union universities so I am so glad to join in with you today and uh, please feel free to interact with me as uh, much as possible just to let you know that this recording would be uh, live um, and will remain on the European Union in Kenya Facebook page for you to rewatch just in case you miss something. And feel free, obviously, to always come back there and uh, check once more and watch the video. And in case you obviously have any other questions, I'm always very much available on the Erasmus Mundus Kenya chapter official page as well as on my inbox, please uh, ensure that you're sending me a good inbox, um, really going straight to the point. But thank you so much for joining us. Please let me know where you're listening in from on the comment section, um, and I would be more than happy to interact with you. So let's get started. I always want to have um, an introductory of what exactly is Erasmus Mundus. Um, and, you know, so many people always ask, is it Erasmus Mundus? Is it, is it Erastus Mundus? Is it uh, Erastus? What exactly is it? So it is Erasmus Mundus. And Erasmus Mundus is just but one of the many programs of Erasmus Plus. And Erasmus Plus as a whole is a European Union funded program for youth, sports, education, and so on. There are so many facets that are under Erasmus Plus, and one of them is the Erasmus Mundus Joint Masters programs, which we highly talk about because these are uh, open to anyone across the globe, including you who is in Kenya. And that's the reason as to why we always want to highlight them so that you can be able to take advantage of these opportunities, golden opportunities, I should say, that you know come about uh, for you to be able to study within the European Union universities. I personally, I am a Erasmus Mundus grant holder. I did my master's between 2015 to 2017. And for this reason, I'm very passionate about uh, speaking about Erasmus and letting someone else having an, have an opportunity to actually come abroad and study. Now, Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's programs usually open for applications between September uh, all the way to March. This is very, very uh, program dependent because each of the programs have their own different deadlines. So that's the reason as to why we always tell you to check the program uh, websites, the program catalogs, and um, be able to see exactly which is the deadline that um, I'm working with depending on the program that um, you know I'm interested in. So in this case, for sure, if you have never heard of it, um, the Erasmus Mundus catalog, I'm going to leave a comment uh, on this live. The Erasmus Mundus catalog website is very much open. And um, in any case, I'm just going to do a very quick very, very quick uh, presentation of the website so that you can be able to see exactly what I mean. Um, and, and this is something that um, is always asked, uh, where exactly is the website and so on and so forth. And sometimes it's a bit difficult to understand where is the website. So I do hope that you can uh, be able to see my screen. And um, this is the program website that I am talking about, we keep talking about. And the Erasmus Mundus catalog um, usually is updated uh, several times. And currently, as of now, we do have 175 programs that are actually on this catalog. Now, these 175 programs 
not all of them would definitely be open for application within this period. However, you would need to check each and every one of them that you are interested in to see whether it's actually going to open this year, or perhaps it uh, stopped the funding, or perhaps will open next year, and so on and so forth. So now, once you see these 175 programs, it can be a bit overwhelming. I know for a fact because I've, I've seen this and I've heard people talk about how overwhelming the catalog is and perhaps they cannot be able to see their degrees straight up. However, there's a way that you can uh, do a filter by field of study. So you can come right here on the field of study and be able to see the different fields of study. They currently have at least 16 fields of study. So we have uh, different fields um, from art, chemistry, economic science, education, environment, and geosciences, information science, law, and the list is really, really um, endless. However, sometimes you might just come to this uh, field of study and really get a little bit lost because for instance, someone uh, sent me a message saying, hey, I want to do an MBA and I cannot find an MBA. Even if when I type on the keywords here and say MBA, it doesn't show up anything. That's just because Erasmus Mundus programs do not necessarily have, uh, you know, the connotations of uh, programs that we are used to. For example, uh, Masters in Business Administration, that is not a program that I have seen personally on um, Erasmus. However, if, for example, you're interested in a business course and um, you've been looking to do um you know something a master's that is related to business uh, or business administration then you can definitely come over uh on the field of study and just be able to see um you know what is closely related to what you want to study so this can be either included in social sciences and humanities sometimes or can also be included in economic sciences. And I'm just going to check these two uh, so that you can be able to see um, in social sciences, all right? And then you will be able to search. Um, now, once you search, you would be able to see quite a number of, of, of these programs. And, um, you know, in this case, you're looking for something to do with business. So you want to uh, keep going, keep going. So you come across such a program, for example, Erasmus Mundus Master's uh, Impact Entrepreneurship. Perhaps this is something that could be very interesting to you. That's one of them. Uh, you could also come across uh, something like this, Erasmus Mundus Joint Master Degree degree in economics of globalization and European integration, not quite business, but it's, um, you know, somehow connotated to business. Uh, we do have things to do with, for example, uh, let's see, keep going. I'm just going to check another one, um, just three of them, just so that we can be able to um, have some examples. And uh, let's see. All right. All right. All right. Uh, okay, okay, still keep going, keep going. Sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. Uh, models and methods of quantitative economics perhaps could also be something that is interesting, um, you know, within your business uh, field. Um, and then maybe you keep going to the last page and see whether you have something else and perhaps you don't see anything else that is uh related to business. So it's time to maybe remove the filters that you have put and maybe just uh, say here, uh, you wanna check everything. So you wanna see whether anything to do with business shows up. So let's see. Um, okay, okay, okay. So um, now you have European Masters of Science in Sustainable Food System Engineering Technology and Business, then that can be a bit discouraging. Um, and maybe you are interested in sale, for instance, something to do with entrepreneurship. Uh, entrepreneurship. Um, and, uh oh, sorry about that. I think it's been misspelled. Uh, because there is definitely uh, a master's in entrepreneurship. Okay, let's see. 
All right, there we go. So we have Erasmus Mundus Master Impact Entrepreneurship, which is what we had seen before. So now once you come to this, uh, any one of the programs that you will see, you will see uh, two links. So the first link, this link that I am highlighting here with my mouse is the Erasmus Mundus Master Impact Entrepreneurship link. And this link usually leads you to just an overview of the funding uh, structure of that program, as well as, you know, the period within which it is going to be open. And so this is something that you also need to be very careful about, because um, this is going to guide you if, for example, you are unable to apply for this program within um, this period of time, so which is between September and March or thereabout, then you can be able to know whether it's possible to actually apply for, for the program in the next uh, you know intake and so on and so forth. So here it gives you an overview of what the program is about. Um, and it gives you also the participating universities. In this case, we have uh, the University of Dilege, uh, we have the University uh, ISM University, we have um, a university in Zagreb as well, a Zagreb School of Economics and Management. So it will tell you exactly, you know, which um, universities are involved, as well as tell you the organization that is actually coordinating this uh, program. Now, you can read different things here there would be the uh, obviously the main collaborating partners and then um you know uh, let me see whether there's a way you can also be able to contact this um you know the project uh, uh, point person which is something that we always encourage now going back um down right there each and every erasmus mundus uh, joint masters program has an acronym an acronym is pretty much the short form of the program. And this is something that the programs actually come up with. So for instance, for this program, we have E-M-M-I-E. -M -M -E. It could be said M-E in layman's language. And this, the link that is right next to the acronym is the link that you always want to click if you want to go ahead and apply for any program. So now once you click on that link, then it will take you to the program website. Now, when you are on the program website, this is where you will find all the information regarding the deadlines, the application, the curricula, and so on and so forth. So for example, this one tells you that applications for the 2023 cohort are now open. Please view the application information page for details. So this is why we always tell you, please come to the program website and check the program application details. So here you would see the program description, you would see the uh, partners, you would see the admission criteria and so on and so forth. So that's the reason as to why we always tell you, please make sure that you are able to, um, you know, check the program website as often as you can so that you are not left out in all the information that is needed. So in this case, you can see that the admission criteria here says that um, it's open to individuals of all academic backgrounds, of all nationalities, and so on and so forth. And uh, in this case, it also gives you a guide on how to apply. So you need to take your time to read all this information. And in case you have any type of um, clarification that you might want to uh, you know, have, we always have emails of the um, you know, consortiums or the coordinating institutes. So for instance, here we have an email here for me at uh, be. So this is uh, the email that you would uh, use in case you need any clarifications with things to do with um, language waivers, things to do with maybe your documents, things maybe you've not yet finished your, your program, you are about to graduate, and you're wondering whether you actually qualify, you are wondering whether you can be able to actually, um, you know, have this program uh, you know, allow you to send the certificate, your degree certificate to them much later as, uh, you know, once you have finished graduation and so on and so forth. These are things that, you know, you are able to ask the consortium ahead of time. 
Now I'm going to stop sharing because I know we have quite a lot of questions that have been coming along. Um, and so I just want to go through into the uh, question section. And uh, I mean, one of the things that you, you have to realize uh, to answer the first question is about, you know, whether do I qualify? What are the, uh, you know, basics for qualification and so on and so forth. So for you to qualify for any of the Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Program, you would definitely have to, uh, you know, have a degree, a bachelor's degree. So you cannot apply if you have a diploma. And so for your bachelor's degree, this is something that is stipulated on each and every program uh, websites. So they will tell you which degree that you would need or, or they are considering for this course. And usually you might find that. Um, perhaps you find a certain course, maybe even that uh, course that we just checked for entrepreneurship. And you see that they are actually um, you know, accepting people who have bachelor degrees in IT, maybe in business. It could also be you might find in communications in a diverse set of degree programs. So that is how uh, Erasmus works. So you might find that a certain program is requesting for people who have certain degrees, as well as maybe certain experiences. These experiences could be volunteer experiences, they could be work experiences, they could also be things that you are involved in, for example, some projects that you might be involved in, and so on and so forth. So it is very important to realize that the basics would be what the undergraduate degree, obviously, your bachelor's degree. Um, and if you have not yet graduated, some programs can allow you to send your certificate much later, as soon as you have got, um, you have received that certificate from your university. Uh, I know this takes quite a long time sometimes when you graduate and then you have to go to your administration, um, you know, to, to check whether the certificate is out or not, some programs actually can give you some bit of time for you to, um, you know, send the certificates much later. However, this time has to be within a certain time frame. It has to be within at least maybe by the time they are closing or by the time they are beginning to, to actually check the, the applications. So they will tell you this time on the program websites. They can also tell you about this time if you send them an email um, in case this information is not explicitly put on the program website. So the undergraduate certificate, of course, some uh, programs might request for transcripts. This is very dependent on a program. Uh, some may not really actually ask for the transcripts, but it is very important to have the transcripts um, because you would need to also show uh, which courses you actually studied in your undergraduate, and then um, you are able to justify the reason as to why I'm a very good candidate for this program is because I studied A, B, C, D, E that you are requesting on your requirements. So this is very, very, very crucial to also um, notice that you need your transcripts handy. You need to have... Um, also, some uh, programs might request for a language test. This is not mandatory. It is very program dependent. And because obviously in Kenya, we study our degrees in English, you can request a consortium, you know, for a waiver for your English language test. So how do you do this? Once again, you go to the program website that you're interested in. If they have said that they need an English test, um, then you can um, send an email before you even apply. You can send an email to them and say, hey, I studied in English. Is it possible to get a waiver for the English test uh, for this program? And I can possibly provide a letter from my university saying that I studied in, in English um, and that can actually uh, it's, it's actually very much possible. Several people have received these waivers, but, is a but, 
some universities might say no we definitely do need for you to do that english test so be very careful with that because again you would need some bit of time uh, a time frame for you to be able to do your english test uh, book it perhaps in the first place then do the english test and then the results are out and then you can be able to upload them so if you're planning to do a certain course and the consortium has said no they definitely do need the english test then maybe perhaps um, if you gauge the time and you're you're like maybe this is quite quite a very short period of time for me to be able to do the english test and then finish the application and 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 be able to uh, upload on time it's okay you can take your time and you can apply for that course in the next intake because erasmus opens every single year it's not just this year it's not just last year it's every single year that Erasmus opens. So this is another thing that you really do need to, to, to have. Um, and once again, obviously, you would also need to have things to do with your CV. Your CV needs to be um, on the Europass format. I have spoken about this on the Erasmus uh, Kenya chapter group, so you can check some information about the Europass format. Usually some programs, once again, it's not mandatory for all the programs to request for a Europass CV format. However, it is recommended that you have the Europass uh, CV format because that is what is acceptable within European universities and European organizations. So this is also something some information that you can check on the program website as well as obviously you would need the core of your application is the motivation or some people like to call it um statement of purpose really it's most of the programs would, would talk, talk about statements of purpose or the motivation statement the reason as to why you're so motivated to actually go and study this particular program this is the make or break of your program uh, application. So your statement of purpose really is, is what uh, you, know, you put on paper, introducing yourself to someone who has never met you, telling them that, hey, you know what, I am very, very good candidate for this program. And I have definitely um, you know, gone through your program uh, details. I, I qualify for this. I have the right experience. I have the right skills. Um, I am also going to bring to the table a few other skills so that you can be able to, um, you know, uh, I can be able to be of value to the program as well. So this is also something that we have talked about before on the Kenyan chapter group. So you can check out for that, uh, for some tips on how to write your statement of purpose. Now, this is very, very important. Your statement of purpose, um, you need to take your time to be able to uh, synthesize your thoughts because not every type of skill that you have is relevant on any one of the programs. Um, and not every one of your experiences is actually relevant to your application once again. So you have to be very careful with this because um, you would need to set your thoughts right um, and to know this is what I want to write on this uh, motivation, the reason as to why I want to do this, the reason as to why I want to study in Europe and not in Kenya or any other place, the reason as to why um, you know perhaps some programs would have what we call a study path which means that you would be able to study um, you know, in a certain given path depending on the curriculum of that program. So for example, you might uh, find um, a program that has a study path um, from uh, say Portugal, Spain, Germany, and they also have a study path from say Italy, uh, Germany, Netherlands, um, and another one maybe from, from um, say Estonia, Denmark, and, and Germany. These are just examples out of my head. And then they would have these three study paths and then you would need to justify the reason as to why you're choosing one study path over the other study path, which would mean that you are doing your own research and seeing that, hey, maybe a certain university in Spain is doing what I am interested in as opposed to another university maybe in Germany and so on and so forth. So these are things that you really do need to take um, your time with and be able to read, be able to understand, be able to see why, why me? 
you have to put that on paper. And of course, um, be able to keep um, the word count because that's another thing. Uh, if they ask for 500 words, it's not a thousand words, it's not uh, 200 words, it's just 500 words. Now, that is uh, one of the other things that you need. You would also need to have um, recommendation letters. And these recommendation letters are usually um, stipulated on the websites, whether they are going to be, um, you know, from academicians. So this would be, for instance, from your lecturer, or it could be from your employer that has, uh, you know, known you for a certain period of time. Um, and some programs might uh, ask you to just upload those recommendation letters uh, right on their websites. Other, web, you know, programs might request that, hey, we need the email of the official email of this uh, person who is actually recommending you. Please note that here they do not accept uh, personal emails like Gmail accounts or Hotmail or, or Yahoo. It would be an email of a person who is officially registered in, for instance, a university, a dot org or a dot, um, you know, uh, a dot uh, whatever the organization that is so it could be for your university it could be for your uh, employer but they have to be official emails and so some of the programs might request for these emails and then they will email that uh, person who you have said is going to be your referee and that person will now send a letter to them uh you know giving a good word about you so make sure that the persons uh, or the people that you are actually um saying that they are your referees they are people who know you and they are people who can put a good word for you and they are people that who can do it on time as well because this is very very time dependent um and so this is these are things that you would need to actually start preparing ahead of time so that by the time the program is closing, you've already done all the work on your CV, your statement of purpose, your recommendation letter, and you're right on time to actually upload it on the program website. Now, another thing that you definitely want to need is, uh, some programs will state this, is a residence certificate. And a residence certificate, this is another question that was asked uh, beforehand. Uh, a residence certificate is not something that we perhaps in Kenya would be very familiar with just because, you know, um, we do not have like official addresses. So this is a very European thing. Now, a residence certificate can be obtained from your area chief. So wherever you actually live, wherever you actually stay, you can go to your area chief and request for them to write a declaration saying that you have been living in this, uh, you know, address for X amount of years. And, um, you know, you can use in this case, perhaps maybe your postal address as well, if you have one, because not everybody does, but your area chief can write this letter, stamp it, and you can use this uh, for your residence certificate as well. You can request your employer, or you can request an advocate to also write to you a letter that says that this person has been living um, on, in this address for this amount of years and so on and so forth. So a residence certificate is uh, something that ought to show your official residence. And in some cases, if for example, because this is not again very common, if you have a utility bill that is in your name and shows your address, so for example, this would be for uh, like an electricity bill or a, a water bill or an internet bill that officially shows your address and your name at the same time. This is something that you can use and you can upload uh, as um, a proof of residence. But this is again, not very common because you know, for electricity, we buy it in tokens, you know, and <laughs> maybe our water bills are not necessarily in our names and so on and so forth. So this is something that you also need to take care of ahead of time. Now, all these documents, uh, you know, you, you possibly do have them, obviously. And then uh, the other thing that I always say is read the eligibility criteria. Uh, it has all the information that you really, really, really need. Um, and you have to take your time to also be able to see exactly what is required of you on a certain program 
and so on and so forth. And so I would also uh, want to invite you, in case you have any questions, if you're listening uh, to me right now, please uh, leave um, your question on the comment section. I'm going to go on the next half hour uh, to answer the questions that I received already and questions that have been generic again. And, uh, you know, if you still do have any one of them, let me know on the comment section right away and I'll be more than happy to answer them. Uh, if you have not yet joined our Erasmus Mundus Joint uh, Masters Kenyan Chapter, our Erasmus Kenyan Chapter, I should say, on Facebook. It's a group that we uh, talk about a lot um, about the application process and so on and so forth. Now, um, the other uh, questions that I have here would be one was about the number of applications that I can be able to actually have uh, within uh, any application period. Now, this is something that used to be a bone of contention, obviously, uh, because before, prior, which was prior to this new funding, which was prior to 20, let's say 2019, it was uh, not, uh, you were not allowed to actually apply for more than three programs. Um, and this was uh, something that uh, used to go on and has been going on anyways. But um, currently we have um, COVID where you can be able to actually apply for more than three programs. However, please ensure that these programs that you are applying for are relevant, very relevant to your skill sets as well as your experiences, as well as exactly what you want to do eventually in the future. So you can apply for more than three programs. You can apply for, for five, for six programs. Obviously, it, you cannot have so many diverse skills that you apply for 10 or 20 programs. Um, you know, so the thing is obviously to keep it as, as, as best as possible. So you want to have your application as really the best version of it as possible. And so within this, um, you know, programs, you can apply maybe for, I would say, maybe like five or like six, depending, depending on you, again, depending on your skill set, depending on what you perceive yourself to actually uh, be able to achieve within that program, and so on and so forth. So again, you don't want to overstretch yourself because for each of the program, you would have to write different SOPs, uh, statements of purpose, for each of the program, you would maybe need to tweak your CV to match that program. For each of the programs, you would need perhaps maybe a different recommendation process, recommendation letter process. You would also perhaps need maybe um, English test here, English test there, and so on and so forth. So you don't want to overstretch yourself because, again, you don't have quite a long period of time to actually apply for the programs. Because, for example, some programs that opened in October might be closing the application uh, period in December already. Uh, some programs that open in November might be closing in January um, and so on and so forth. So you want to be um, as, as, as very, very uh, congruent as possible. So you don't want to overstretch yourself. You don't want to, um, you know, put a shoddy application and then wallow later why they did not pick you up. So it is true that yes, there is no lim limit. Once again, it's, it's, it's no longer, um, the limit for three programs is no longer there. And that is a very good thing for you to take advantage of. Now, there is also the, the uh, fact that so many people have asked about um, you know, uh, what is the caveat um, regarding returning home? So the thing about Erasmus programs is that they are very open in terms of, um, you know, if depending on the uh, plans that you have on uh, for your future, you can uh, write even on your statement of purpose that, hey, you know what, I would like to actually benchmark a little bit in Europe, perhaps work in Europe, or maybe pursue a PhD in the future in Europe, and then before maybe going back to to, to my country, but there is no caveat that you have to go back to your own country immediately after you finish your course. You can decide to either um, go back or either stay around, depending obviously on the country that you are domiciled in. Um, and, and, and the immigration uh, rules of that country. So that is something that is very uh, different. I don't wanna talk about that, that here, but yes, you can remain or you can decide to go back to your own 
country. Um, now, there is also the question that, uh, you know, people ask about um, uh, the mobility. Explain a little bit more about mobility. And I was like, okay, now the mobility here, I, I presume, is about moving from one country to the other. Okay, so let's talk about it. So all the Erasmus programs will have at least a minimum of two European um, universities. So which means that you would be able to go to a minimum of two European universities to study there. Now the program is for two years, right? So which means that in these two years, you have a total of four semesters, right? Now, these four semesters, so what happens is, say, for example, you apply for a program within this application period, and the program ends its applications with perhaps some in some time in, in December or something of the sort, then they will take their time, they will check the applications, etc., and then they will uh, tell you whether it's a yes or no, and if it's a yes, then you would be starting your program in September of 2023, which will be your first semester. Now, how it works is that uh, your first semester would be from September all the way to sometime in February, March there. Um, and then your second semester would begin perhaps maybe in, um, I, I would presume maybe in June, July there, depending um, depending on the program as well. And then uh, wallowing or through into sometime in September and then September to February and so on and so forth and then you finish your fourth semester sometime in 20 uh that would be 2025 um sometime in June right so now within that period of time depending on your program so like I said each of the program will have like at least a minimum of two universities that you go to some programs have four, some programs have five, some programs have even more because they also have a, an option for you to do an internship. So let's take an example of the program, one program that I like, which is Erasmus Mundus in African Studies. Now, Erasmus Mundus in African Studies, you would start your first semester would be in Portugal, in the University of Porto, and you would... Um, study from September all the way to February uh, of, 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 of the following year. So we would, for instance, say September 2022 to February 2023. And then from there, you would go to Germany and you would study uh, from now uh, sometime in March or thereabout all the way to uh, August, if I'm not wrong. Um, and then the other semester would be now you go to France in the University of Bordeaux, which would be now from September all the way to February. And in between this winter school, in between um, in between the, that semester, and then from Bordeaux, there would be a period where you actually do an internship in a country in Africa. So that can be of your choice, depending on as well, again, on your program. And then after you finish your internship in an African country or any other country that you presume that you would do your research better there, then you come back to any one of uh, either University of Porto or the University in Germany or the University in, in Bordeaux to do your thesis. So that would be your fourth semester. That's just an example. So, for instance, that master's has four universities that are participating. Other universities might have an internship option in between the semesters, um, and other universities might just have winter school or summer school, pre-summer school, or um, in between uh, have a winter school. So the mobility would be that you're moving from one country to the other for every semester. So, for example, you're moving from uh, Portugal, going to Germany. Now the process of moving again, this is something that is covered within the stipend that um, you know is offered by Erasmus. So now you would be moving from Porto and going to, 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 to Germany, obviously changing all these things. You have accommodation to change, you have to uh, change into the different processes of that particular country. You would also need to have things to do with residence cards of different countries or uh, different immigration uh, stamps for uh, a student for each of the countries. So this is something that you would need to do on your own. This is something you also learn. However, it's not like that you are alone because in most cases you will be moving with your 
cohort or you'll be mo moving with the students that you began with initially. So you are able to maybe uh, make some friends and you're able to maybe do these things together and it becomes an easier process. So the mobility from one country to the other is something that uh, is core to Erasmus. And, um, you know, this, this movement also uh, helps you to learn uh, different aspects of Europe, different uh, aspects of the culture, different aspects of the language, and so on and so forth. And the good bit about it is that Erasmus also has the option for you to be able to learn the language of the country that you're actually going into. So you would perhaps maybe be able to learn Portuguese, uh, Germany, uh, German, sorry, Spanish, Dutch, and so on and so forth. So this mobility allows you to study in different uh, European universities. And then once you graduate, graduate some programs i have to say this because it's some programs might give you different certificates for each of the universities that you graduated from other programs prefer to just have one document where they state that you know you graduated from university a b c d e it's very dependent on a program and how they do things and don't expect for some universities to have a big graduation ceremony like we have in in, in uh, kenya um and expect also to have your certificate maybe sent to you much later once you have graduated because this is also something that they do um, you know they take some bit of time before they can be able to send your certificate but um, again the process is very much worth it and also this follows up to another question that I received as to whether or not you can be able to move you with your family so maybe your immediate family maybe you have a kid or you have a husband or you have a wife and so on and so forth and you would like to move with them so it is very important to understand that Erasmus does not cover for your immediate family however depending on the circumstances that you know you want to move with your family maybe they can uh, apply with a different type of, of visa or different types of, of, of um, uh, entry into the country that you're interested in like i said i don't want to talk about that this is a very technical thing but erasmus does not cover for uh your immediate family again another question that what i received was about whether erasmus actually covers for phds i want to make this very clear is that erasmus used to have a um, joint uh phd programs which is no longer there so currently, if you want to do a PhD, we have another program uh, known as Marie Curie, and we have several other funding schemes within um, Marie Curie and also within European Union, we have Horizon 2020 and so on and so forth. And you can be able to actually check uh, them out and apply for them. Now, I want to check the questions on your uh, on the comment section here. So yes, uh, Daniel, you're interested. Good initiative. Uh, yes, keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Could there be a, an age limit for the applicants? No. So there's no age limit. So this is also something, uh, such a fun joke that we always make, um, that you know what, there's no uh, age limit for Erasmus. Um, and in fact, there was there was a joke. I keep liking to make this joke. I don't know whether it's funny anymore, but um, the oldest Erasmus student was, was, I think, 87 years old, which is quite, quite interesting because, um, you know, they apply for their Erasmus and they were in the classroom and they, it didn't matter about their age. So, no, there's no age limit for the applicants, obviously. So this is something that, uh, you know, needs to give you some bit of morale that even if you miss it this time, then you can be able to perhaps maybe apply for the next uh, application period and so on and so forth. So don't be afraid about that now good evening Duta. i hope you are very well uh okay i currently applying for an erasmus modus journalism joint master scholarship in the application form there's a slot requiring one to fill in the language future test date does this mean i can submit an application package awaiting my language results yes yes you can do that however i recommend that you send an email immediately to uh, the mundus journalism masters uh, program and request even to have a waiver for the language test and if they say yes then you would not need to perhaps do that language um, test however if they say no then you would definitely definitely need to have it 
And also, um, it's very also important to notice that, yes, uh, some programs still have the UK, for example, um, as a participating country, it will no longer be the case in the future. However, we still have some programs that are being funded with, um, you know, the first university perhaps being like, for example, the University of Glasgow, which is more uh, popular with Erasmus actually. Um, and, and you would definitely need to have the language test for you to be able to at least even apply for the visa to the UK uh, and so on and so forth. So please make sure that if, for example, you're applying for a program and that program includes the UK as one of the mobility uh, mobilities, then it's very important to um, also gather the documentation that is needed for the visas for that. So that would include an English language test, a TB test, uh, and so on and so forth. The list is definitely uh, available on the websites that are relevant for that. Now, um, there is also other, another thing that uh, about mobilities that I never mentioned here was about as you move from one country to the other. So when, when you're in Kenya, you do not necessarily need to apply. You do not need, it's not necessarily, you do not need to apply for the visas for all the countries that you will be going to because you will apply for these as you move. So for example, if your uh, first country is Portugal, then you go to Spain, then you go to Germany, then it would mean that the first uh, visa that you're getting is, or applying for, is uh, a visa to Portugal. Once you're in Portugal, um, once you finish your semester, as you move to the next country, then you would be able to actually apply for either a visa to that country, or um, sometimes you can actually be able to move with the residence card of uh, the previous country because you're in the Schengen zone, which means that there's free entry and exit as long as you have a residence uh, permit. Um, for some countries, if, for example, your residence card already expired, then you need to apply for a visa as you move to the other country. So that is very important to understand that you don't need to apply for all the visas all at once while you're in Kenya. Now, uh, let me see something else. Um, okay, so uh, another thing that I also definitely want to mention in this live video is the fact that, um, you know, the, the there are so many questions regarding, uh, oh, I cannot be able to see someone who can be able to read my statement of purpose, or can you be able to read the statement of purpose? I'm always happy to read some statements of purpose, but I am very, very, very much packed. So one thing that you can do, if you want to uh, connect with people who've done the program that you're interested in, it's very crucial to check out um, LinkedIn, go on linkedin and do your good uh, search and see if there's someone who's previously done this program before and can be able to actually assist me by going through um, my application um, you know general application my cv my recommendation um and so on and so forth. In other uh, ways, if you, depending on the social media handles that you like, whether that's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you can be able to also connect with people on these social media pages who've possibly done these programs or go to the official websites of these programs, the official social media websites of these programs, these social media websites are enlisted again on the program website so that you can be able to actually uh, connect with an alumni or a current student who is actually um, able to maybe uh, take their time um, and read your statement of purpose and read your CV and read your general application and so on and so forth. So you would need to you know, introduce yourself in a nice way. Don't just go saying just hi. So you would uh, introduce yourself very well and say that you're interested in this program. And you're like, um, is it possible for you to be able to check my program uh, application in general, uh, or maybe give me some pointers. And also each of the programs, most of the programs I should say, because not all of them, uh, they usually have an open session where you can ask a question. And these open sessions could be either webinars or they could be um, Instagram lives, they could be Facebook lives, they could be um, on YouTube and so on and so forth. So it's for you to do your due diligence, to be able to see 
who exactly can I approach or where exactly can I get the information that I really, really do need um, for me to have a very good application. So do not sit on your question forever and, and, and wallow and wonder uh, whether there's an answer to this, please always ask that question. You can ask it in the group. Um, I tried as much as possible to answer each and every one of them on time. If I don't, then please make sure that you can be able to also check uh, other people who can answer this question amicably for you and, um, you know, be able to move on with your application on time and make sure that this application is something that, you know, is, is, is of good quality because that is a thing that we've been lacking with Kenyans. I must say that last year we had a very good number. We have had over 20 people actually coming. The previous year we only had about uh, nine or 10 and so on and so forth. So I'm happy to see the momentum gaining, uh, you know, and, and I would love to see for you to actually be able to apply for it and do a very good application and be a candidate that can be accepted in any one of these programs that we are talking about here. Um, a question, is it a must to have a passport at the time of applying? Yes, yes, yes. A passport is something that is the first thing that you have to get if you are applying for any type of scholarship outside um, our good nation of Kenya. So this is the first thing that you have to 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 actually uh um you know get yourself um so you would definitely need to uh do the relevant processes on a citizen um and and, and be able to go to either one of those uh places whether that's near your house whether that's in embo that whether that is Mombasa, wherever it is that is convenient for you for you to be able to get your passport on time so this is very very crucial however i must say that for example if you do not yet have your passport right now and you have seen a course that you are very much interested in which you're very very uh you qualify for that course please once again write to the consortium explain to them that your passport is yet to be processed can you be able to use your id to show as an identification uh, prior to you getting your passport and you can mention to this that to them that hey you know as soon as i get my um passport then i would be able to actually uh send it over to you for you to process it along my application so that is something that is very 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 crucial i cannot stress that enough um now, uh, again, it's it's very important for me to also uh, uh, mention this to you, that these programs are usually fully funded, which is something that I should have mentioned before anyways, but they are 100% fully funded. What do we mean by fully funded? Fully funded means that, one, all your tuition is paid for. Two, you have insurance for you for the period of time that you'll be studying, which is two years period. And then also that the fact that they will give you a monthly stipend and this monthly stipend in some programs currently is still 1000 euros. Um, so for those programs that will give you a thousand euros monthly stipend, they would also give you an extra allowance, which they call one uh, travel allowance, which is 3000 euros per year or academic year and you have two academic years here they will also give you a thousand euros in installation cost um however for the newer programs that began their mandates between 2021 to 2027 dependent on also the agreements that they have you might find that they're giving a flat rate of 1400 euros in stipend money and this is inclusive of the travel allowance as well as the installation uh, uh, allowances and um, which means that from that amount of money that you're receiving you would need to make your plans uh, in terms of the transport in terms of the accommodation because again Erasmus does not uh, cover for accommodation. You need to find your own accommodation in the various cities that you would be going for. So fully funding means that your tuition is catered for, your insurance is catered for, your uh, stipend, monthly stipend is catered for, um, and basically, uh, you know, also dependent on maybe there are some, some 
programs might have a caveat where if you do like a language and you pay for it, they might be able to reimburse that depending on the program and depending on the agreement that they have. And this language uh, that I am talking about is the language of the country that you will be studying in. So for example, if you're coming to Portugal and you're going to study Portuguese language and you have to pay for it, so sometimes they might be able to reimburse that cost. However, some programs might already include it and so you don't have to pay a single cent for that. Um, and again, when you are coming from uh, Kenya to your first country of mobility, in this case, uh, some programs might tell you that you have to actually buy your own ticket. Uh, and then once you come in, the travel uh, allowances would be able to actually cover for that. However, you can always ask for the program to maybe buy the ticket for you and then remove that amount from the travel allowance, um, you know, uh, so that you can be able to, to, to foot in uh, various costs that are involved uh, for you, be, you know, as a transition from Kenya to the various uh, countries within Europe. So now um, that is obviously something that is very relevant for anyone who would be able to actually get uh, to get a yes for the program or a successful candidate and so on and so forth. Now, um, one last thing that I would like to mention because this live session uh, needs to be just one hour. Uh, uh, so one last thing that I would want to mention is um, during your application process, make sure that, uh, for example, things to do with uh, your CV, your Europass CV is not too long because there's a thing that we have as Africans and even as Kenyans that we tend to uh, write as much as we speak because we speak so much, we use so many words to say one thing and we can translate this to um, our CVs and also our statements of purpose. So for example, your CV in the Europass format or whichever the format that you are going to use if the program has not uh, specified it, needs to be very congruent. So you would need to ensure that it's not like five, seven pages, really. It's not all going overboard. And what you're trying to put on that CV is something that is relevant towards the skills set that they're looking for. It's relevant as well towards the, the experiences that you have and also puts you or sets you apart among other global applicants. Um, also for the statements of purpose, like I said, it's very important for you to structure it very well through from the introduction to the conclusion. Remember, if for, in, for instance, you have only 500 words, then you would want to have, um, you know, all the information that is very relevant right there. So in terms of using run words, make sure that you're not using uh, extraordinarily amount of words that are very irrelevant. Um, and also you are making sure that you are stating your case. You're stating your case in terms of your experience. You're stating your case in terms of the skill sets that you have and utilize certain programs, for example, Grammarly, for you to be able to check your grammar, whether it's correct or not. Um, and, and these are things that nitty gritties that we talk about even on the group that um, make sure that your program, uh, your, your, your CV or your statement of purpose is uh, can be read by someone else before you even upload it, can be corrected by someone else, or uh, as well, make sure that you can check it on Grammarly. Um, to ensure that there are no grammatical uh, mistakes, uh, that the phrases are correct, that you're not uh, overusing words, in, in other words, um, ensuring that there are no run words. Um, and then uh, obviously making sure that, you know, these, these things are taken care of ahead of time so that by the time you're uploading it um, and what you said on your CV, what you said your, on your statement of purpose, if your program includes an interview, because some programs will ask for you to have an interview as soon as they are, you know, checking all the applications and they are like, we need to interview this one, this one, and this one. So what you will say on your interview needs to be congruent with what you wrote on your CV and your statement of purpose because the interview is basically um you know a session for you to be able to affirm what they've already read 
on your application and to show that for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, you are a favorable candidate as opposed to other candidates who've also applied for these programs. Now, it's, it's, it's again, like I said, if you cannot be able to apply for these programs uh, on this, um, you know, application period, it's okay. You can al always uh, prepare to apply for the next time that they will open because again, come September, October, they are about uh, next year, then these programs will apply uh, open for applications once again and they will have that application period between um october september october they're about all the way to february march depending on the program so look out for that and don't rush over uh, your application so that is what i can tell you for for a fact we are here to assist you and once again uh I would like to also thank uh, a special thank you to the European Union in Kenya for um, you know having these platforms and be able to to um, you know motivate you to actually apply for these programs because they are very life changing. I would say that for a fact because I have gone through the program myself and uh, for sure I am not the same person uh, since I came to actually study in Europe. And in any case, you're able to understand the European culture much, much more. You're able to understand, um, you know, the interaction between other students, international students that you might be studying with. You're able to understand several facets that you never knew about uh, certain courses certain um you know certain uh you know curriculums and so on and so forth because it's very immersive i must say erasmus modus Judge master's programs are very immersive which means that you uh study a lot uh but it is all worth it now you say hi are there specific professions or programs with high chances of in terms of qualifying no i would not say that because again uh if you check the program websites most of the programs will actually tell you how many people they should be able to take within a certain funding period they would also tell you there's also a part for you to maybe if you would like to uh, do self-funding um so they are very open with this information because it's not like um it, it's about the high chances uh of, of qualifying it's about the funding that they have for a certain period of time the applications that they receive the quality of these applications as well so it is not like you know one program will have have a higher chance of, of getting a scholarship as opposed to another uh, program. That's not how they, they function. What happens is that, you know, they've been given a certain amount of funding between, uh, you know, for example, now 2021 to 2027, there's the amount of funding that each of the programs have been given. And each of the intakes, they will have to A, remain within budget, B, remain within the, the cohort or re remain within the amount of people that they can be able to handle within every cohort. Um, and also consider the quality of applications, the number of people coming from country A, B, C, D, E to Z, you know, it's a global application. So again, it's not that one program, uh, you know, applying for one program will uh, put you at a higher stake as opposed to applying for another. It's always make a very good quality application, convince them so that, you know, they can put you within that time frame that they actually have in that program. So um, there's no bias, I should say that, they should there's no bias as to you know uh one program um taking more people from kenya as opposed to another program that's not the case in any case uh th there are no more caveats of you know um we can only take a certain number of people from kenya or um, a certain number of people from nigeria that is not uh, something that is no longer there there is going to be a blanket you know pool of people where you know put everyone who's applied from the globe then they would be able to check these applications and let me tell you this they are che I checked manually so the statements of purpose the cvs they are manually checked it's not a machine or a robot that checks these applications so they're che checking applications from across the globe and seeing which of these actually are better and which of these are the best anyways
depending on the uh, criteria that they're looking for and so on and so forth. So I would hope to see you apply. Please make sure that you join the Erasmus Mundus, the Erasmus Kenyan chapter rather, uh, Facebook group um, for Kenya so that you can also follow other discussions that um, we have there. I've done quite a number of videos as well uh, to assist people to actually uh, go through this process and I would hope to see you applying for it. Please make sure that you can reach out to us on the group and reach out to me in case you have any specific question that is not covered in the group because I always uh, invite you to first check on this, use the search function of uh, that group so that you can be able to see whether there's information that has been already covered and uh, I would love to see you you applying for it and coming over to study in Europe. So I will end it at that. And thank you so much for listening to us. This uh, live session will remain on the EU in Kenya Facebook uh, page. So please make sure that you can follow through uh, the updates there. You can come over and rewatch it once again. And um, you know, until next time, have a great evening. And I hope to see you applying for these programs. Bye.